Wilkinson. I'm Professor of Law at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and I'm going to talk about my book, Authoritarian Liberalism and the Transformation of Modern Europe, published last year by Oxford University Press. This is the cover of the book, and the cover gives uh, a sense of what the book's about. Um, this is the Angelus Novus, Paul, Paul Clay's Angelus Novus, which was acquired by Walter Benjamin and inspired his thesis on the philosophy of history, which captures both the book's starting point in the interwar period and the sense of swimming against the current of historical progress in the way that Benjamin um, wrote about. And so the book um, puts together these two ideas, authoritarianism and liberalism, which are often juxtaposed and suggest that in fact, as a historical constitutional matter, liberalism in the 20th century depends upon political authoritarian structures for its support and its sustenance. And this is presented chronologically in four uh, parts, beginning, as I, I said a moment ago, with the interwar period, um, which already differentiates the book from a lot of accounts of European integration which begin in the post-war era. I suggest that the interwar era is essential for understanding um, the development of uh, European integration, but also the domestic constitutionalization process in various core countries of Europe. Um, and then the, the book follows in four parts. Um, part two is post-war era, essentially from Rome until Maastricht. Part three is the road from Maastricht to Lisbon. And the final part is the uh, Euro crisis um, period, the unfinished conjuncture, as I put it in the book. And I try and explain in the book why um, it's unresolved. And although the book begins in the interwar era, the idea for the book begins in a close analysis of the Euro crisis and the politics and um, constitutional politics of the Euro crisis, which came to the fore after the election of uh, Syriza in Greece, and in a sense came to a head after the Ochi referendum in 2015, um, uh, where the Greek people voted against the memorandum, which was then imposed uh, um, uh, upon them. <laughs> um, this is a coup uh, capturing that moment. But in a sense, what I wanted to get with the, with the book was the reasons for uh, the um, stability, paradoxically, of this arrangement, despite the extraordinary um, instability that was being uh, provoked um, through the various Euro crisis interventions. And it was in this period that a lot of commentators were uh, comparing the Euro crisis conjuncture with the interwar uh, era, the rise of authoritarianism um, following various economic crises um, in between the First and Second World War. And the book itself begins with the jurisprudence of Weimar. Um, which uh, occurs after the crisis of the liberal state of the long 19th century, um, the march of the masses onto the stage of history, as Eric Hobsbawm put it, which um, rises the, raises the, the possibility of democratic socialism and liberals of various stripes and conservatives and even some social democrats uh, fearful of uh, a, a more revolutionary uh, left turn towards authoritarianism or in the case of the social democrats tolerate the authoritarianism um, uh, of uh, late Weimar uh, for fear of the uh, alternatives both on the left and the right and this um, period was captured by uh, Hermann Heller who coined the term as far as I'm aware coined the term authoritarian liberalism uh, uh, which he saw in this period before the Nazi seizure of power 
um, as an attempt to maintain the capitalist system by authoritarian means. Of course, it, it failed, and part of, the, part of the first part of the book is to explain both the turn of liberals towards authoritarianism, um, specifically um, away from parliamentary democracy, and the failures of that strategy in Weimar and beyond. And Polanyi's work was um, useful here in showing how the turn of uh, uh, liberal authoritarianism extended far beyond uh, Germany, in fact, was a worldwide phenomenon. Part two of the book then explains how in the post-war era, um, after the diagnosis, and in my view, misdiagnosis of interwar collapse occurring as a result of an excess of democracy, whereas in fact it was um, a re the repression of, of, of democracy. But the, the post-war era uh, is presented in the book as structured um, along these three dimensions, uh, restrained sovereignty, tempered capitalism, and constrained democracy, uh, which tran transform interstate relations, socioeconomic relations, and state society relations. This is what I call a formation of passive or soft authoritarianism, because it doesn't work um, through the harsh dicta and decree of uh, the, um, the harsh repression of parliament, but rather occurs through various constraints. Um, and this is captured by the idea of a fear of popular sovereignty, a fear of the people. We are afraid of the people, as um, Christoph Muller puts it. Based on myths of hyperinflation, um, of democratic excess, of legal positivism, all leading to the collapse of uh, liberal democracy. And the success of the myth, this myth, um, depends on various political um, uh, strategies, constitutional strategies which turn towards technocracy, managerialism, integration through law, political centrism, and the power of Christian democracy. All of which together foment this fear of political freedom, the displacement of the citizen uh, by the icon of the consumer, it's the age, as Ketty calls it, of the relative equalising of conditions between labour and capital and the quietening of the working class. And I say that this occurs through various uh, means, one of which is the depoliticization of the economy through the creation of an economic constitution. And uh, I explain how that occurs in various domestic settings, um, focusing on Germany, but also integrating aspects of uh, the French and Italian uh, stories. Um, and gradually, um, the European economic constitution, pushed um, in large part by the European Court of Justice, comes to reinforce uh, and consolidate the depoliticizing tendencies of passive authoritarianism in the post-war era, which comes up, of course, against various um, social movements, but those are uh, then turned again in the, after the 1970s into a, another round, if you like, of um, uh, constitutional strategies to, to contain democracy. Um, and in some ways that reaches a high point at Maastricht, where the constitution of economic and monetary union um, upscales the ordo slash neoliberal uh, constraints on um, political democracy increases this void between rulers and ruled, uh, the hollowing out of Western democracy, as Peter Meyer called it. Um, but also, as certain counter movements begin to grow, um, which have both systemic, as in the case of the Const German constitutional courts, pushback, but also anti systemic, in, as in the case of various. Um, uh, uh, right-wing nationalist parties, all the while uh, the um, distance between uh, elites and the people is uh, growing. And this is not only a matter of political, um, constitutional uh, uh, 
uh, cause, but also can be identified in the distancing of the public intellectuals, um, as in the case of Jürgen Habermas, from um, the democratic movements themselves. Despite a frequent diagnosis of the EU as suffering from this growing democratic uh, deficit. So Maastricht is interesting because although in many ways it, it deepens and continues the story of authoritarian liberalism, it also um, provokes various counter movements which grow into the Euro crisis era but become uh, um, unresolved as a result of the very weakening of democracy that uh, the, the post-war settlement was meant to bring about. And in the conclusion to the book, um, uh, well, in fact, I, sure, I make a, what might seem to be a slightly surprising conclusion about the, uh, the absence or presence of a hegemonic stabilizer. Um, I said at the start that the Euro crisis is irresolved, unresolved, um, and not because um, of the hegemonic stability of uh, a powerful country, even though the imbalance after Maastricht grows with the power of Germany vis-a-vis -vis the other member states, but rather because in the final analysis, there is lack of a coherent opposition to the status quo, because the right populist movements, although rhetorically antagonistic towards the EU, are able to pursue their programs from within the EU, whereas the left um, and anti-systemic movements, which were, are unable to pursue their projects within the EU, nevertheless have um, the lack of a capacity and a constitutional imagination of leaving the EU, which means that the uh, overall crisis is irresolved. And so in the conclusion to the book, I suggest that although authoritarian liberalism is ultimately a weak formation, it retains its um, soft uh, hegemony. Um, if you want to <laughs> discover more about the book, um, please read it and let me know what you think. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Giuseppe Martinico for the invitation to record this um, short video and uh, I hope you enjoy the book. Thanks very much and goodbye.